Hey, everybody, welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. I'm your host, Patrick Kirby. And of course, we bring on guests to help our small and medium sized nonprofits do good better. I have a confession to make on the top of the show. Um, I am going to, in real time, live out one of my professional fantasies with all of you today. Uh, and that professional fantasy being that uh, someone comes up to me one day and says, Pat, I really like what you do. And I would like you to run my family foundation. And then all of my friends really like you. And I would like you to help them give away money for the rest of eternity. And so uh, I don't have this in my life. And so the best next thing is I'm going to find somebody who does this. And I'm going to live vicariously through her for an entire episode of the official Do Good Better podcast. I would love to welcome to the show Sybil Ackerman Munson. Uh, she is the uh, president, founder of uh, Do Your Good, which is another thing that we need to talk about because we're so uh, aligned correctly with verbiage. Sybil, welcome to the official Do Good Better podcast. Thanks so much, Patrick. It's really fun. And I love the title of your podcast. <laughs> I, we're going to get I a love lot of folks that with. have good in the name. I know. Rocking. <laughs> yes, this is going to be so much fun. Uh, <laughs> as people are flipping through and, uh, and they're looking through iTunes and they're looking through YouTube and they find, uh, wow, two companies with the amazing word of good and doing in them. Uh, I like all of these things, but I have no idea who Sybil Backerman Munson is. Please, for the uh, uh, listening audience, if you could give like a 5,000 foot view of who you are, what you do, and why we're chatting today. Yeah, I'm so happy to be here. And I am here today because I just care so much about supporting nonprofits. And, and I love what you talked about, Patrick, where, you know, I feel so lucky, like I want to pinch myself and I want to just give back because of, of that. Um, you know, I was an activist. I worked as a nonprofit professional. And then I did that for over a decade. And then one day, one of the folks that was funding the work that I do, he was a mentor of mine, but he was also a donor. He came up to me and he said, Sybil, do you want to run my foundation? And I was like, oh my gosh, I would love to. <laughs> and the thing that's sort of funny though, is it took a little while. He said that, and then he didn't really respond afterwards for a while. So then I said, okay, I'm going to make him interview me like it's a job interview. And I brought him to a coffee shop and I explained to him why I'd be good for his foundation. Anyway, I was a, I was a little young there, <laughs> but, but yeah, so um, I started working for this family foundation that funds small and medium nonprofits in Oregon and also other places too. But we may, with that foundation mainly focuses in Oregon and essentially he brought me on um, over 10 years ago. And he said, Sybil, think of yourself as an activist with money. You have experience out in the field. You know, he doesn't as much. He was more of a donor kind of person and give to the folks that you think should, you should give to, because you were out there, you were conservation director at Audubon Society of Portland. You were working on natural resources work, environmental work. It's what I care about. And I trust you. So we had a great relationship, although the thing is, when you jump into being a funder, I thought I was like, oh, yeah, of course, I'll just jump into it. Ah, I didn't ask the right questions, but this family, luckily, was great, is great. Um, and then uh, over time, what happened was more families found out that I do this kind of work, and they asked if I could work with them. And so I started contracting with more and more families. And now fast forward to today. I work for a whole bunch of families that fund small and medium nonprofits, and I see, see myself as a connector. It's very important to me to support small and medium nonprofits and bring them forward to donors that care. And so that's, that's what I do in my business where I have one-on-one -on -one clients. I process over 100 proposals a year. Over the course of my career, I've helped give away over $45 million in donations. Um, and mostly smaller donations. When I say small, it's between five and $50,000 about. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's different definitions of small, but that's where I work. And I love the people I work with. Over time, I said to myself, oh my gosh, I'm amassing all this information in my brain. <laughs> and I really want an outlet for it. So during COVID, I decided to create an arm of my business called Do Your Good where I have podcasts and I, I'm creating a course and more than one course, I've got all this creativity in me. And so I really want to like give back to nonprofits and other people who are donors to help them give their money away effectively. And, and that's, I could keep talking, but I'll stop there. 
that that's what 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 my story is and i'll stick to it <laughs> I like I like podcast interviews where I'm as in uh, intrigued about what's going on and uh, talking. I just kind of sit there with my arms under my uh, chin. And go, yeah, keep going. I love it. <laughs> I love this. I, I love this framework uh, for our conversation today because I think our small, medium-sized nonprofit friends don't know where to start, especially when it comes to building relationships with funders. Um, I think, and you know this uh, probably better than anybody, is. The idea of approaching a funder or a family foundation or something like that is uh, terrifying if you don't have a previous relationship where you don't really know what to do first. And, I, and what I love that you're doing here, and especially with your know, coursework on trying to figure out how to actually create funders in the first place and sneak preview, uh, sneak preview for later in this conversation for helping nonprofits navigate this. Um, how, what, what's the starting point? Uh, where, where on both sides of the relationships, from the funder into the nonprofit side, where do you both start to both decide to give money away and how to, how to navigate that craziness and then how to approach somebody with funds to get funding? That's I a loaded, love, that's no, a loaded long, that's a loaded <laughs> question that deserves a very nice answer that I will, uh, Go back to listening. Uh, intent. Okay, Patrick, I, I'm going to need your help because um, what I think we should do is start out with the, there's sort of two conversations, right? I'm having I, if we're talking with this with the nonprofit community, um, that's a conversation, and then if we're talking with donors who want to be effective, that's a conversation, and they're slightly different. But I'm trying to talk with both of those very important individuals mm -hmm. because we need to have those individuals who are in different worlds connecting better and more effectively. So what I'd love from you is to help me out because what I'd like to do first is really because it sounds like your podcast, well, you're talking to both folks as well, yeah. but you're really talking it, talking to nonprofits. Mm -hmm. Can we talk first about how a nonprofit can approach a donor and, and how they can be effective and, and what they can do? And then I want to talk like I'm talking to a donor after that and talk to a donor about what they can think about um, and try not to repeat myself, but have slightly different perspectives. Does that I love sound it. good? I love it because I think then the nonprofit can hear from what a uh, potential funder is thinking as well. And that uh -huh. benefits, I think, everybody in the long run. So I'm a small nonprofit. Awesome. Sybil, I connect with you. We're meeting over coffee. I don't know what the hell to do first, but I know that there's a family fund or something going on like that, but I don't know what to do because there's no course based on this because I'm just guessing. <laughs> Okay, well, the first thing I want to say, Patrick, is that the fact that you're sitting down with me for coffee, congrats, you're doing a good job because you found me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I want to acknowledge that the first thing that can be really challenging for smaller or medium-sized nonprofits who may not have a big fancy development arm um, of people that are like, that's their profession is to do that, but you're relying on the executive director and staff that are doing work on the ground as well. This isn't their only thing they're doing. First of all, it's really hard to find the people to sit down and have coffee with. And once you find the people like on a website or something of a foundation, it's hard to convince them to take the time to sit down to have coffee. So let's talk about that hurdle first. And then what I want to talk about is let's say you've got my attention. Um, how do you then keep it? And how do you make sure that you get on the dockets of all the people I work for? Okay. So, um, because, you know, that's, uh, there's, there's stuff in me that it's just hard. This is, this, this is hard stuff. You know, I hate that it can't always be so easy to find people and get people to sit down. It's just people get really busy. So let's talk about strategies to be able to get the attention of either myself or a trustee and you're a busy nonprofit and you don't have a big fancy development arm. You might have a few folks. Okay. Okay. This is how you're going to get me to take the time to have coffee. First, if it's an issue you care about, you've done your research on the web, that's the first thing, done your research on the web and you've seen, you've found a bunch of different foundations that overlap with the issue you're working on. The other way you can do that when you've done the research on the web, this is the number one thing, do your research on the web before you even approach someone like me. There's also something called funder collaboratives in the issue area you might care about. So for example, in the environmental world, that's the uh, Environmental Grant Makers Association. But there's equal associations in any issue you could care about. Those institutions have lists of foundations. 
And there's a whole bunch of other potential resources on the web that you can find. And probably in the show notes, Patrick, we could list some of those so folks can get more information. Do that first before you even reach out to me, you know, get put together a whole bunch of different ones and you can find usually on there, there's some contact information. Websites are impossible though, from foundations to actually find the person to talk to usually. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of times, and some foundations don't even have websites, but I think that's why the grant makers associations, they'll have names of, of, organ, of foundations that don't even have websites because I know quite a few that don't, right? So, but the associations will help and then also do the search on the website, mm-hmm. number one. Okay, everyone say, oh yeah, of course, so we do that. But, oh, it's interesting because sometimes you, people start jumping into, well, why aren't I getting any responses? Well, first look at the websites, make sure that what you're working on fits the guidelines, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. The next thing to do just to get, make sure you can get connected with the key people you need to talk to at that foundation is before you reach out to me, before you email me, think about the organization you're working for <clears throat> and what issues that you're, wor- are you, you're working on, what issues are in the news right now? What issues, and I guarantee you there's something, right? Um, no matter what organization you're working for, there's something very important that people are talking about in the news, in social media or in the New York Times or in your local newspaper. And make sure that when you start to reach out, to that list of foundations that meet the criteria that you're working on, you do a special email or social media post or any other forum where you know your target donor audience is. You connect a commentary to the trending news that everyone is reading. I can't impress upon you enough how many times I get phone calls from my clients who are the donors who say, I just read this newspaper, this article in the news, which nonprofits are working on that? Because that's how the donors are accessing the information. They're usually very busy folks. They have lives that aren't directly related to the issue that they're funding oftentimes. And if you can connect it to that, then I have a donor calling me saying, what's happening with this issue? And then I happen to get an email from somebody, even if it's a cold email saying, Hey, Sybil, I see you work for this foundation. It works on X issue. Here's what we're doing on that. You might've seen this local op-ed that we either published, or you might've seen this issue that's trending. Here's how it connects. And that really helps me because I will spend time with folks that my trustees are saying, this is an issue we care about. This almost, sorry, Patrick. This is confusing because this is, uh, this is, uh, it seems like you need a plan. And yeah, some sort of purpose on uh, <laughs> rather than reaching out uh, blindly, there has to be some thought process behind it. And I think that's such an insightful piece because nonprofits, I think, are reactive most of the time. They are in um, fight or flight mode all the time about their budget. They're looking for funding immediately. And rather than thinking about what's the long term play, how do we build rapport? How do we build relationships long term? And having a game plan and mapping something this out is the way to get there rather than a frantic dash to see how frustrating it is. Nobody's getting back to me on an email because I need funding right now to do this X, Y, and Z. And what you're seeing to say is you should plan a long-term strategy for these. Yes. And most likely... So I come from the natural resources environmental world. So, but I know your listeners work on many important issues. Most likely if you're planning um, and you're really knowledgeable about an issue you're working on, you can tell when there's gonna be an uptick in something in the news, right. in something you're working on. You can say, okay, um, I'm planning a tree planting that's super important at the capital of the state that I work in. And there's going to be a lot of news around this because we're bringing in all these interesting people. This is when I'm going to do a special personalized email or however you like to interact with your donors. But I want to add a little flavor to this. The thing that doesn't work as well is, you know, I get hundreds of blast emails every day. I like them, but I don't pay as much attention to them. What I pay attention to 
is a personalized email to me saying with the direct link to something happening right now that then I'm getting phone calls from my donors talking about it. Oh, I just got in an email from X person working on this and I may have never heard of that group. I'm excited I can go talk to them. I have a five point plan. So why don't we go through that, Patrick? Because that was my first point mm -hmm. is respond to the hot news. I can't tell you how few people actually do that. You know, it's so funny. The Oregon legislature just ended and the private family foundations I work with don't fund lobbying. So we're not directly engaged there. However, I'm super interested in what happens after the session, like what bills got passed because my clients really care about all the different things that people are thinking about and, and where is the energy gonna go and in terms of key issues. I got all, I get, I get emails from some of the folks I work with saying, here's what happened here, the next step, but I don't get as many as you'd think I do. Mm. I think people assume that trustees and foundation folks um, are getting information in that real time, but they're not. A lot of times, I think the first mistake that um, nonprofits make is they think, okay, I put on my calendar when my final report is due. And so I'm going to do that. And I've got the money. And then in 12 months or whenever that final report's due, that's the next time I talk to the folks. And um, I think that's my number one is, is respond to the hot news. Mm -hmm. My number two, do you mind if I go through the five? Please. Total right now, is that okay? Okay. I'm jotting them down. Yay. My number two is, and a lot of time, again, a lot of nonprofits do parts of this or all of this, but these are the things that I want to pick out is when I've seen all these proposals in my relationships, these are the five key points that gets people money, at least in my perspective, mm -hmm. from my experience. No guarantees, but <laughs> if you did this with me, it would work really well. I like it. Um, so number, number one is respond to hot news, personalize it, tell us. Number two, be clear with yourself. Who is your ideal donor? So this is a mistake I see often happen. Groups in their strategic planning or other things, they say, okay, we need to raise more money. But they don't do the exercise that I've forced myself to do in creating this new business, which is think about my ideal customer avatar. If you're trying to raise money, think about, be clear with yourself about who is your ideal donor. Because there are lots of different kinds of donors. And if you try to appeal to every single one of them, your materials are going to read like, I don't know, you remember Muzak? Like that kind of music that's in the elevators that everyone's supposed to like, but everyone hates. <laughs> so, so really get yourself connected to the kind of donor you're looking for. Do you find and, that as niche as niching down to who you're trying to get from a donor's um, uh, persona, the greater that people want to join that? I mean, because again, I, what, I'm, what I'm finding in, in a lot of nonprofit work is if you get down to like, I have an ideal donor. She is 30 to 45 years old. She is a single mom. She's got three kids. She's got this or whatever is that you get so good with that messaging. You get so good with why you need that is that everything else becomes exponentially easier to get people on board. And that's where I think the brilliance of this is just sort of a, a niching down and being self-aware of who you're trying to connect with because everybody else is drawn to you because you're so specific about your needs and you're exactly. so good at communicating it. Exactly, exactly. Totally. Thank you Brilliant. for that. Brilliant. And that's number two. Be clear. We're going to get a little more nuanced on that in another one of my points, mm -hmm. which is know what kind of donor you're talking to. So I'll talk about that in one second. That's my number four. <laughs> number three, this, you, this is really important. Keep it personal. Mm -hmm. So Patrick, you alluded to this before. I hate being treated like a transaction. Hate it. I'm doing fun. I'm doing the work I'm doing and supporting the donors and supporting nonprofits because I genuinely care about the issues that we're working on. The people I work for generally care. You know, they, they genuinely care about all of this work. So if you treat me like a transaction where I have this very formal meeting with like three professionals and we sit down and it's very much like, here's what we're doing and here's our glossy, glossy brochure and you check all the boxes and then you say, okay, and when is your next proposal deadline? And when can we apply? And how can we do it? Um, all of that, of course, you should ask those questions. But if that's all you ask, 
and you haven't linked it to the issues of the day and you haven't taken the time to actually learn also about who I am or who the person is you're talking to, their background, their work. And it happens to me all the time where folks are like explaining to me what certain things are that are going on. And I actually served on a board or commission that created that rule. And I sort of smiled at myself. Okay, it's nice. <laughs> they obviously didn't look in the web because it's not that hard to figure out. So those are the kind of things I'm, you know, it's, but then there's great people who really do do that. And we speak on the level. Uh, but uh, it, we can talk more about that if you'd like to, but no, and, don't and, and, treat donors like a yeah, transaction. You can't, don't, yeah, you can't, you have to ask better questions. You have to listen and you have to connect the dots. And it is, if you are only asking about donations, if you're only asking about what they can do for you, you're missing the point of relationship building in the first place. And if you are not asking better questions, you have no idea who they are as persons. You can't know who, what they love so you can connect even more intimately back to your first point, which is be self-aware and notch down to what you specifically you want to tie to. You'll never know if that person aligns correctly with your ideal donor if you don't ask the questions in the first place. Yes, yes, totally. And and I lived this firsthand when I worked in the nonprofit world where I'd be sitting in board meetings and there'd be raging debates around foundation folks. So, you know, there'd be a grant. Somebody would say, well, the, I'm pissed at this donor because they um, are asking too many questions. They should just be giving us the money. And then another person on the board would say, no, well, we should listen to them and sort of think through what, what they might want as well. And of course, there's an honest debate over this. There can be times when donors do not do it well and get too micromanagey. Yeah. That's why I have a whole course on how to give money away effectively as a donor. And we can talk about that in a minute yeah. because there's definitely places where that can happen poorly. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there's a, there's a good middle ground where you can not treat a person like a transaction, yes. um, but treat a person as a person. And you'd be surprised at how great a relationship you can develop Shocking. with them. Yay! Shocking. And again, I think most people get this. It's yeah. not like rocket science, but it's Correct. always nice to say out loud. Yep. Um, okay. And then the next thing I wanted to talk about is um, know what kind of donor you're talking to. So um, this is something I just invented in the middle of the night after thinking about, I had a couple of meetings with some of my nonprofit friends who were trying to raise money. And I was telling them about all the different donors I work with and they're, they're applying to, for funds from like two or three of them. And each, per, each foundation I was talking to them about was slightly different. <laughs> and I was thinking, gosh, nonprofit leaders are amazing because they're trying to navigate all of these different personalities. And, mm -hmm. um, but then in the middle of that, I, it hit me oh my gosh, there's three distinctive different types of donors. And nonprofits need to know this because it really matters if they need to know the different types because if they know that, then they can do their pitch better. Mm -hmm. So the three distinctive types are a sustainer funder, a campaigner funder, or a launcher funder. If a person is a sustainer funder, then they want to give, they love the group just in general. Mm -hmm. The group fits their, their interests completely. They love going on the outings. They love doing the annual dinners. They might volunteer. They just love everything about that group. They'll give multi-year funding. They're not going to ask many questions um, about specific things. They just love the group. Um, and then let's say, I'll use an example in the environmental world. Let's say they love watching birds. They're bird watchers. Mm -hmm. So that would mean they'd love maybe Audubon. Um, and there's a lot of local chapters. And so they love just doing that. So that's great. A campaigner funder is a completely different kind of funder. A campaigner funder is someone who cares about changing a societal norm. So there'll be some, there'll be a donor that'll be like climate change is real. I'm using environmental examples because that's who I work with, but yeah. you can probably cut and paste for any issue. <laughs> and they say climate change is real. And we want to support groups that are going to help us um, limit the impacts of climate change and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That is changing a societal norm because right now our automobiles are dependent on fossil fuels. We've got a society that is based very differently than that at the moment. So those funders care more about the cause and the issue than they do in particular about your nonprofit. So when you approach a campaigner funder, you talk to them about benchmarks, issues, projects. You don't approach them saying, why don't you come to our next annual dinner or come to a long meeting general webinar about something. 
because they won't be interested. They'll be interested in these and you only have their attention a little bit. You got to come in and do it the right way. And so that's a campaigner funder. A launcher funder, they love starting new things. They love finding the gaps in a field they care about and then putting a whole bunch of money in in the beginning to help either start a new organization or to help a group fill a gap. Like if there's not enough scientific information about something or other pieces, they'll come in in the beginning and then they'll taper off their funding over a five-year strategy. So if you're talking to a launcher funder, you want to talk to them about the gaps you see in the field that you're an expert in, how they can help fund that, how they can help support it, the leaders that you could fund to help get there for those issues. And so that's key. So know what kind of funder you're talking to, a sustainer, campaigner, or launcher. So that's number four. And number five is very important too. It is fundraise from a place of abundance. <gasps> what? No, there's not yeah. enough money. No, there's not enough money anywhere. No, there, nobody has funds. Everybody's desolate. <laughs> and, there, and there's no way that we could ever do that. That's so, it's, oh my gosh, it's so important. So when I'm giving, helping and supporting folks give money away, I'm looking at it from a place of abundance. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, I love meeting people where it's a match. Yeah. And if there's a collaboration among nonprofits, they could raise even more money than they could individually. Yes. But I find that I do have to re remind folks that it's not competitive. It is additive. And so, um, and a lot of times groups are so focused understandably on making their budget and keeping things going that they can get worried about collaborations or other things. But it is definitely key that um, while the nonprofit itself understandably can be thinking in limited terms in terms of how much they can raise, when you're talking to someone like me or a donor, you don't necessarily at all have to talk from a place of limitation. Mm -hmm. Talk about your dreams, talk about your hopes, talk about what would you need to make something succeed. And you'd be surprised at how many more donors might be interested in coming over to your cause. Mm -hmm. I, I, love, I love this one for the, the reason, instead of a list of one through five, I'm almost imagining this as an actual circle itself. Where it I starts, love that. Where it starts yeah. and ends with fundraise from abundance. Because if you start with the brain power of, all right, everybody has the, there are so many people who have the capacity to give. There's so many collaborative opportunities. We can make a difference for the things that we believe in that we're going to go in and we're going to respond the way that we would want to respond to anything within the news. We're going to go and address those straight out to get our name out, to be uh, the forefront thought leader of whatever we're talking about. We're self-aware enough to know uh, who we're trying to navigate towards. And so we're going to write about the things in the voice of that specific donor that we want to go and hit right? We want to do it as personal as possible because we're going to ask better questions to everybody else. And we know exactly the type of the person we're going to go meet with eventually because they've at least self-identified or whatever. And going in for the ask or going in for the pitch itself, we still start and end with that idea that this is good for the, for the environment. This is good for our community. This is good for our organization. It's great for the donor because we start with the idea and we end with the idea of abundance. And that's I love that. brilliant about this. I think that you and I are going to be collaborating in the future. <laughs> that is a fact as a matter. Uh, what about this? And this is a brilliant list. And, and thank you so much for sharing that um, because this is going to help so many people sort of just finally compartmentalize the idea of how to uh, sort of uh, work in this uh, environment, which not a lot of small, medium sized nonprofits are, are very familiar with. Oh, and Patrick, oh. I'm doing a free workshop on this in July. <gasps> Please so do tell about totally this. Totally free. Totally free workshop. It's going to be, um, and not too long so that I know everyone's busy, but it'll be in July, July 22nd at 10 a.m. And I'm, I haven't, don't have it posted on my website quite yet, but it will be posted very soon and people can sign up. And so they can learn a little bit more about that. By the if time you're a podcast, nonprofit person. By this time, this podcast launch, you'll already have that up and running and we'll link that Rockin'. in the comments below. 
Yay. Um, so I love this from the angle of a nonprofit trying to figure out and navigate the uh, the muddied waters of how to work with funders. Um, but from a donor standpoint, right, I think to get into the mind of a funder is so unbelievably opportunistic. And I would be uh, it would it would it would be a terrible mistake if I didn't ask uh, to elaborate on that piece, too, because I think the more as nonprofits understand what the brain power and the mindset are from a funding standpoint, the better we can actually have some of these more critical conversations because we know what they're where they're coming from. So I'm hoping you can take a little bit of time to kind of talk about on, on that end, um, as that's kind of something that you're working on on Do Your Good. And that's where some of this coursework comes from is how do you align that? I, I love the question, Patrick. And I'm going to say something that probably a lot of folks have heard before, but you hear you meet one one foundation, you know, one foundation, you meet one family, you meet one family. The most important thing to remember, and this isn't to be discouraging, because then we'll talk about some trends and things that I've seen. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing to remember <clears throat> is that everybody is human. Everybody is a person. Everybody has lives. Everybody is busy. Um, there's not some, it, well, there might be in some situations, but when we're talking about families that want to fund small and medium-sized nonprofits, it's usually families you know, they're not the mega, mega, mega rich. They are interested in doing good in the world and they see small and medium foundation, excuse me, uh, nonprofits. Usually those are nonprofits in their community. They see that their dollar can really help them. It's very much more personal, which is why I love working in this space with families who care about that. And so it also means that, the, that, that it's not like this staid situation where we have these fancy trustee meetings and all this, it's not, doesn't happen that way. It's much more like, okay, we want to help these groups civil, you know, let's go through this list of groups. And they sometimes do site visits because usually they live in the community. Right. And so there's, and I shouldn't even say site visits, it's like meetings and talk directly with, I love that. I encourage that, that the um, trustees talking directly with grantees or nonprofits that I think would be great, or they just meet people in the field. Mm -hmm. It's very interpersonal. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's key. So first thing is that people are people, think of it as a relationship, like you think of any other relationship. Yes. Um, and I know that there's a lot of trainings that help you with like very clear, specific things, but I also am sort of, I'm a little more of the ilk of break it down, be real, man. You know, don't worry too much about the glossies. <laughs> and, and Make sure you have your facts. Yes. Else. Now then we'll talk about sort of some other things. But well, the other thing too, and I love that you put that is, is that there is, uh, there is human as we are which means yeah. they don't know as uh, they don't know anything more than we know. They, they are not um, uh, elitist areas. They're just families who want to do good. And, and because they're human, they don't have all the answers and they probably have a couple of questions that they don't know the answers to. And, and so not knowing an answer and, and being petrified of having a conversation because you don't have all the answers or all the answers that you've come up with that you, they might ask, and you're terrified because you don't have an answer and that's preventing you from even engaging is half the bat. If you can get that out of your brain, that this totally is conversation it's, you've won. Yep. That's yep. the matter of just aligning, Yay. right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. that's such a, that's such a wonderful thing to hammer home is that you don't have to be perfect, but if you no. don't start conversing and building rapport, you'll never, you'll never go anywhere. Yeah. With and that whole yeah. Totally, totally. And, and a lot of the folks I work for, not a lot, I guess, I, some of them really don't even want it. Some, it goes to spectrum. Some folks don't even want anyone to know that they even have any money. So it's like their friends don't even know. It's, it's very confidential because they want to be regular folks helping the community. Others are known as, as funders, but they also are out in the, in the world. They live in your communities. They are going on the hikes. They are doing things with you. And, um, and so that's the first thing is there's all that piece. Okay. But now let's talk about if you're asking me now, put on the donor hat, right? Don't. So, so what is, what are, what are donors thinking about? And if you're a donor, how can you um, connect with nonprofits in a positive way mm -hmm. um, and an effective way? And I mean, the first thing is be real, be you just like with the yeah. nonprofits, yeah. <laughs> I think you'll have the most yeah. fruitful relationships mm -hmm. there. Don't create too much pomp and circumstance you know, meet the, meet the uh, organizations where they're at. If you really don't know what you want to do yet, definitely go on some outings with the group, do things that they're already organizing so that you don't um, end up having them take extra time with you yet until you know what you want to do. But 
Um, there's so many different places to go here, Patrick, with your question. Mm -hmm. I, I want to think about, I guess, two main things, and then you tell me which ones you want me to get more into. Yeah. The first one is um, I would want to ask the donor or the person who wants to give money away, they have money to give. Are you clear, donor, on what makes you passionate about the world? Are you clear, donor, or about what makes you wake up at night in the middle of the night worried? Mm -hmm. Are you clear about the area you might want to focus on? Are you clear about how much money you actually can give away? Because that's tiered to how focused you should be on a particular project. Mm -hmm. If I have a, actually, I have a, I have a course for that, <laughs> thinking, um, that I've already created that's on, on my website called Making Your Money Matter, Give With Purpose. And that's for donors who they may not all, they may be giving money away, but not feeling totally connected to what they're doing. And so what I try to do here is I'm trying to help the donors um, and people who have money really first think about what ticks for them. What do they care about? And how much money do they have to give away so they can be effective no matter how much money they have to give away? So it's really a question of connecting with your care and, the, and what you care about, doing the research on your own first to be able to sort of think through what you might want to do. And then um, think about how much money you have to give and then be really clear with yourself about what you're not going to fund as much as what you will fund. And I, in this course that I offer, I put myself through the same exercise. It's really interesting for me, actually. And <laughs> I'm not going to tell you yet what I came away with or my focus, but it was interesting. It wasn't actually what I thought that I was going to say, even though I do this for a living. Um, when I started thinking about, okay, how would I give my own money away? It was very interesting what I came up with. Um, and so that's, that's the first thing. We can talk more about that if you feel like it, but let's talk about the second piece too. Um, but that's important. First, you really need to do a strategic plan for yourself of what you care about before you even hire someone like me, an intermediary, because you don't know the kind of intermediary who's going to help you give funds away if that's what you need. You don't even know the kind of person you want to hire yet there if um, you don't know exactly what you want to give to. So for that, think about your passion, do web research, and think about how much you feel comfortable giving away each year. So there's a whole piece and process you think there. Okay, number two, the second area, you might say, oh, I know exactly what I want to give to. I'm super excited. I'm, I'd say, yay, I'm so excited for you. Even the trust, even the folks I work with, I have to tell you, aren't always comfortable with where their focus is. We revisit their focus all the time. I'm going through this with one client that I've been funding in a particular area for five years. We're revisiting the strategy now. It's totally okay. So, you might say, I'm totally clear. I know what I want, but I haven't met that many folks that are. So it's, it's, it, that's, I just am going to say it's okay not to be. Mm -hmm. That's sort of why I created that other course to help with that. But number two, you might say, okay, I know what I'm going to fund at least for the next two to three years. I'm super passionate about it. I care about it. I love it. The next thing I want to talk to you about as a donor is, is how do you give your money away effectively so that the nonprofits aren't ending up wasting more time than the amount you're giving them, just preparing for their proposals and doing all the work you need them to do. How are you making sure you're not leaving money on the table when you're giving grants? How are you making sure that you're evaluating your grants effectively? There's a whole host of things in this world that are really important. Mm -hmm. And so as a donor, you not only should be thinking about what you care about, but also think about carefully how to give money away in a way that will increase and empower the field that you care about. And I'm just finishing up the, a course that I'm gonna launch. I shouldn't say finish because I'm like putting, putting it together now, but I'm gonna launch it in September to help people go through steps. And I have seven steps, which is talking about first being clear on the kind of funder you are. Are you a sustainer funder? Are you a campaigner funder? Or are you a launcher funder? Mm -hmm. That's really important because then you can be clear with the nonprofits about how you want them to approach you. And almost no donors that I know even do that first. They don't say, okay, do I want to do one or the other? Um, and that's really important there because then you can get the information immediately from the nonprofit you want. 
if you're clear on if you're a sustainer, campaigner, and launcher, and we talked about that, but the differences are already. Then the next part of my course is I talk about being open-minded, which is to focus you in on staying out of what I call a funder bubble. Mm -hmm. Because you're giving money away, too many people will, will say you're right. <laughs> and in the regular world, people will push back on you. That's how you develop, you fail, you do things. But as a funder, too often you get in a funder bubble. And so in this, this lesson, I have the nine key points to think about. And if you're doing any of those, you might be in a funder bubble. And it's things that I always talk to myself about. Oh, are you doing this, 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 this? Mm -hmm. And then I have tenants to live by so that you can sort of think through it. That's a little bit of a lesson where it's like mushier in terms of making sure you're thinking about it. It's not as practical, but it's super important as a donor, because if you're not listening, if you're not hearing, if you're in a funder bubble, you're not giving money away effectively mm -hmm. because no one's telling you really what they need. And I'll tell you a quick story about this and then go to the next ones. The quick story is I was a nonprofit professional, right? And then I got hired to be a foundation executive. That was my first job as a full-time executive. Yeah. And I was, I moved over to fund the nonprofits that I used to work with. And I worked as a lobbyist before I moved over. And as a lobbyist, people were always battling conversations, intense, tense stuff, right? So I went over to work as a foundation person. I go into my office the first day, I turn on my computer and I got these emails from all my friends, people who I knew for years. And I knew they were like, some of them were even a little angry with me <laughs> just yesterday, you know? Um, and all the emails were, Sybil, how are you? I hope you're having a good day, blah, blah, blah. It was all very positive and happy. You know, I love everybody, don't get me wrong. It's so wonderful that people were so nice. But what I was thinking more about was, oh, this is dangerous. Because I feel like I really know what's happening in the field because before I was really in the muck of it. I was in the trenches. And so that's why I have that part of it is to just as a funder, make sure, because if you don't know the real information, you can't fund effectively. So then the next thing I want to talk, want to talk about is being proactive, which is how do you, and this is another lesson I have, is once you're identifying the kind of funder you want to be and, and how you want to be in the world um, and not be in a funder bubble, you want to be sure that the way you are asking for proposals is linked to the kind of funder you are. And so I talk about, you know, if you're a sustainer funder, you might want to do an open application where you can get lots of fun, lots of ideas in from different nonprofits. Or you, if you're a campaigner funder where you're very specific, you might want to hire an intermediary. So I talk about all of those different pieces. And then um, the next lesson is about being collegial and to remember that, you know, funders talk to each other. We talk to each other all the time. And when I was a nonprofit person, I didn't realize how much funders talk to each other. We have meetings, we, we are always talking because we care about the nonprofits that we're jointly funding. And so if you're a donor, seek those out, seek those collegial relationships out because they're really helpful. And I have a whole strategy for how to do that in, that, in my lesson. And then I have a lesson on being finance savvy. So financially looking at budgets and how to think through those and the high priority items um, that are the most important and the things not to worry about as much. And then I have a final lesson on being legal, the things to flag um, as you're looking at proposals and that kind of thing. So it's a pretty hefty course, yeah. but it's also meant to sort of, even if you're an experienced funder, I think there's things that you can, I have worksheets and I'll have direct interaction, like any worksheet you do will go emailed straight to me. So I'll be looking at that. Um, and it'll be, I have videos I'm creating and all these kind of things. So it'll be lots of interactive opportunities. And then I have a quiz at the end and sort of a certification. Mm. So even if you also want to have a job like mine in the future, you want the experience, you can take this kind of course and maybe be able to do what I do in the future because it's freaking awesome. <laughs> so I want everyone to do it. Well, here's, here's the best part about both of those uh, angles, right? From a, uh, from, a, from a donor quiz to, all right, well, how do we execute some of these when I'm really excited or I don't know what the hell I'm going on? It comes down to two things as far as I'm listening and sort of uh, taking copious notes on this as well, Yay. which is over communication from a nonprofit to a donor or a funder, super important. But the idea is practically the same. If you're looking at some organization that doesn't necessarily know what they want to do or, or a funder that doesn't want to do, that's the same as a nonprofit trying to figure out what they want to fund in the first place. It's the same scenario. Figure out what you need to fund 
and then figure out how much money it's going to take to fund it. The same way that the funder needs to figure out how much money that they have to fund the DING project in the first place. And then it's just managing those expectations afterwards. That's what it is. And, and it's, Patrick, it's, that's you know, perfect. Perfect, it's sim- perfect. It's simplicity. Yeah. And so when you're, a, when you're a nonprofit, you're a small, medium-sized nonprofit, if you can put into self in your brain, whether somebody loves your uh, topic of, of conversation or what you're doing for an impact or whether they have no idea what the hell they're doing, it is they're following the same steps essentially as you are trying to create a proposal, the same way that they're trying to create the idea of how on earth they're going to fund the things they love. And if you conceptualize that, right, and you add your element of fundraising from an abundance standpoint, knowing that these individuals want to help you, you want to help them help themselves, and all of a sudden you want to make impact in the community, you're a perfect fit. You just need to figure it out and take those first steps forward by having those conversations and using somebody like yourself as a, uh, you know, sort of a medium between them uh, to figure out the easiest path and the ones with less resistance between them. Yeah. I love that, Patrick. And, you know, the hardest part of all of this is connecting between the nonprofit and the donor. That's what I do. I love that, but it is, I want to just help that happen more and more. And, you know, that's, that's why we're trying, I'm trying to create these courses, but I know you care about that too, Patrick, is how do we get more funding for the charities that are so important and connect them? And how do we help donors do that more effectively? And that's where, you know, intermediaries like me can be your friend and help, but also trustees and, and donors can do it directly to help the nonprofits. So Great conversation. Thank you. This is going to be one of those things where I feel like your phone's going to blow up off the hook when people get to. Oh, I hope so. Because I think they just have general (laughs) questions. And so if they do, if they are, if they're nodding their head going, I want all of these things. Give me all the things. I want all the courses. I want all the connections. I want all the emails and phone numbers. How on earth do they get a hold of you to begin this conversation, to flush out what, what they do next? Rocking. Yeah, no, no, this is great. I'd love to talk to people. That's why I created Do Your Good is is for that reason. So the first thing is my website, www.doyourgood.com. And then I also am on Facebook and Instagram with the handle. It's the little at sign. I know my, my son laughs at me because, you know, I said little at sign, but whatever. The handle, Do Your Good. And so you can find me there. I'm also on LinkedIn. And I have a podcast myself um, and it's, you type in do your good on any of your favorite streaming services or my name, um, either one, you should be able to find me, Sybil Ackerman Munson or do your good. And I have a weekly podcast where I interview uh, foundation folks and trustees and also nonprofits to really get at these questions that Patrick, you and I are talking about. And, uh, and I have these, this free webinar, July 22nd. And then I'm launching my courses, um, my first course, the Crack the Code course, I'm launching that in September, as well as I'm going to launch another course in the fall. And then I have an evergreen course online, which is to help donors if they want to figure out how to give their money away, even, you know, their passion for what it is that they want to do. So thank you, Patrick, for all this. It's just such a fun conversation. All right, listeners, you got to get clicking your uh, pointer finger and your clicking mouse is going to get your workout clicking on all the things that you just got mentioned and are in the show notes below. So go find and follow Sybil on everything and go reach out to her and make sure that you are asking some questions on how you can start engaging in your own community. Dang it. This has been awesome. I guarantee you, uh, I'm just going to throw that out there that this won't be the last time uh, you'll be on the podcast because there's going to be so much more. And I know we want to keep it, you know, People have the attention span of nets. I could talk to you for, and I know we joked before we went on the air, like, hey, we don't really typically do the three hour Joe Rogan ask podcast. We could literally have done the three and a half hour Joe Rogan podcast today. I totally agree with you, Patrick. And you're going to be on my podcast too. Yes. So that's the next one. You're going to be there. So <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, with, I mean, this is such a wonderful, generous amount of info that you gave today. So thank you so much for that. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for being on the official Do Good Better podcast. Thanks for being awesome. And thanks for having a do and a good in your name, because that makes you the coolest person in the world. Love the names of our groups. <laughs> thanks so much for listening this week on the official Do Good Better podcast.